Good evening, and welcome to Inner Community. Tonight, our guest is John Mitchell, and he'll be talking about the San Jose Clock Tower Restoration Project. Hello, welcome, John. Thank you, Brian. Pleasure to be here. So, tell us about the clock tower and how you got involved with it. Well, the clock tower has got quite a history in San Jose, and when we speak of the clock tower, we're speaking of the actual tower itself, which is significant because it's the last Romanesque, Richardsonian Romanesque federally built building uh, on the West Coast. And then there's the actual clock itself, which was put in there uh, after the Ot 6 quake to uh, replace the Seth Thomas clock that was destroyed. And the clock that in, is in there now and has been there since 1908 is a Nels Johnson clock. And it's uh, very significant in and of itself. I became interested many years ago when I saw the incomplete tower it just kind of goes up a little bit and then it's just a flat roof and it always seemed to me that there should be something more there and uh, it turns out there is supposed to be something more there. So um, it got destroyed in the 1906 quake which is the uh, anniversary is tomorrow and Nels Johnson. So who is Nels Johnson? Well, Nels Johnson was a young Swedish uh, immigrant. Uh, he came from a very poor family. Uh, at the age of uh, 14, he immigrated to Canada, and then he immigrated down into the United States where he became a, an apprentice to a blacksmith shop and learned the trade of uh, ironworking. And from that, he gathered a great deal of interest in um, clock making or horology. And uh, from there, began making what we consider today so probably some of the finest tower clocks uh, ever created in the United States. And fortunately, uh, we have one in San Jose that was brought here after the Ot 6 quake. It wasn't intended for San Jose. It's much too big of a clock. It's powerful. Uh, it's too, too powerful for a clock tower this size. But we ended up with it, and uh, it's, it's quite a story in and of itself. Um, it's the, uh, the tower then was never completed, and we know this because Inside the tower, there's a 1,500-pound brass bell, a McNeely brass bell that was uh, uh, cast in uh, Manistee, Michigan, that was went with the clock, and it was installed at the time. However, there's no tower to the clock. There's no cupola, or what they call a belfry, to uh, put the bell into. So ever since the uh, clock was installed by Johnson himself, uh, the bell has never been struck. And it's something uh, that the city has, that the city of San Jose has been deprived of all these years. It's sort of like uh, a community having a heart that nobody can hear beat. Yeah. So no, no bell, no, no, to let people know. Uh, even the clock tower is there. So how do you know? How do people find out where it is? And well, you bring up a good question, Brian. I would guess that probably 98 percent of the people in San Jose don't know they have a town clock. Uh, simply because it's been ignored all these years. And uh, this is ironic because San Jose now uh, bills itself as the capital of Silicon Valley. And it, as it turns out, that this Nels Johnson clock is the oldest continuously operating piece of high technology in San Jose, and yet nobody knows about it. And it's just been there forgotten all this time, running continuously, like that heart that nobody hears beating. And uh, this is what uh, we wanted to get uh, done to the clock tower so that downtown San Jose has a presence finally. So it has no, it's part of te San Jose's uh, technological history, but right. it doesn't have, it's not, it's running, but it's incomplete. So how do you, um, how, what are your plans to restore it? How would you go about well, over the years, it, and it's not just me, but just probably going back, as, we don't know why it was never finished in 1908. They, they uh, just leveled off the top of the building, put the clock in there, and when Johnson installed the clock, somebody asked him how accurate it was, and he said it was accurate within eight, eight seconds a month. And they said, well, is that good? And he said, well, if you want better, you need to talk to God. So it's been running ever since, and since that time, there have been uh, but we don't know why exactly they stopped, they didn't complete the tower. There were a lot of things that transpired in the last hundred years. We had the, uh, the Spanish influenza that hit San Jose in the, in the 1917-19 era period. Then we had World War I, and we had the Depression, and there were all these historical events 
that sort of cascaded one on to the other that uh, probably just civically st stopped the city from completing its, its uh, town clock. So it's going to be private, privately or publicly funded? And this is another tough, rather tough than federally. one. federally. Private yeah. funding would be terrific, uh, Brian, but uh, uh, there's a couple of problems. They're not, they're not a problems, they're obstacles. Uh, number one, it's a, uh, a city-owned building. So going out to the private sector and asking them to donate money to, f to fix a public building would be like uh, asking the citizens of Mountain View or, or some corporation in Mountain View to, uh, for money to fix the steps of City Hall or something like that. It, like what? Um, the other thing that's kind of tricky is that uh, fortunately, in many respects, uh, the building itself was declared a, a National Historic Registered Landmark back in the 1970s. Um, I think this was to protect the building because there was a lot of redevelopment going on at the time. There were a lot of old and historic, structurally significant uh, architectural pieces, buildings are being torn down. And uh, fortunately, we got a historic landmark designation for the building, the clock tower, um, which, which saved it. But at the same time, when we go to restore the clock tower, it has to be restored meticulously to Secretary of Interior Standards for Historic Reconstruction. So as far as getting somebody like uh, some big corporation to say, oh, come and fix it up and put your name on it, that wouldn't work. Yeah. So that's kind of the conundrum we face with this. Plus, the city has no money outright to fix it. So, And no crowdsourcing or any kind of... Well, we thought about that, but then we have to, we have to get uh, a lot of people on board with that, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here tonight. Um, I'm on the board for the Preservation Action Council in uh, San Jose, and our mission is to preserve and enhance and protect uh, historic architecture and buildings. And by doing something like this, we want to get more people involved uh, in this valley in the preservation of historic structures and architecture. If people want to get involved um, with the Pre Preservation Action Council, how would they go about doing that, contacting well, you? or Sure, yeah, they can go. I think they'll put a card on the screen sometime here. Just preservation.org. Or if they're interested in the uh, clock tower, it's just sjclocktower.org. The problem that we have, Brian, I think, at, in this day and age, there's some irony and some uh, difficulties here. This valley is uh, historically uh, been a very innovative place for technology. Right up at, at the time they were building, rebuilding, starting to rebuild the clock tower in 1908, right next door was a fellow named Doc Harold, who... Uh, started the very first radio station, broadcast radio station in the United States. And he was playing old Victrolas and stuff like that. And there's speculation as to why he built his radio, or put his radio station right next to the clock tower. And I suspect it may have been because he anticipated that the clock tower would be completed and the bell could be heard. If you listen to a station that says, oh, hello, this is KMTV, uh, the second most thing they repeat after a station will repeat after its call letters is the time. The time. So I think Doc Harold wanted to be next to the clock tower so he could hear that bong, bong, it's two o'clock in San Jose. Um, so we had some very early innovators in, in technology and I don't think that there's a lot, I suspect there are a lot of people today in tech that don't realize what they owe this valley um, in terms of what technology, where it came from and how it started. But this is the very genesis of technology in San Jose. This, Doc Harold's radio station, and there's suspicion that there may have even been a telegraph line going up to Lick Observatory so they could have very accurate time for their uh, astronomical observations. So all these sites exist, but they're not being given the funding that they should have um as historically, and you know, just the, they have value within the city. And well, that's it. We're, and we'll try at uh, the Preservation Action Council to bring out value and show people that there's value. Um, again, in this valley of technology, it's kind of ironic, but the, uh, the problem for us is that everybody is thinking about tomorrow, the next big thing. What's the next app? What's the next great invention or technology? And it's so hard to get people to turn around and look back and say, oh, this is where it all started. IBM building out in South San Jose, first hard drive in San Jose. 
a lot of things came right from this valley here. Um, so that's kind of the problems we face right now. Yeah, things have been speeding up with technology yeah. and everything. It seems like it's almost getting lost within um, just the uh, acceleration right. of um, the valley. You know. Right. But it's still there. It's just it's another there, layer. People just don't know it. And part of our job is to make people aware of this. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've been attempting to do is introduce, uh, to find a, uh, a home for what we call a STEAM, or science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, this is called the uh, Art and Science of Time. And you can read about this on our website, sjclocktower.org. And it's to get young people interested in science, math, engineering, via the means of time and timekeeping, because it's the most critical thing there is. Ironically, most young people today, if you approached them and said, and asked them if they knew what uh, the term quarter to five meant, they'd probably be stumped, because everything they use today now is digital. And they think quarter to five, they go, 25 minutes? No, they, so they're not used to analog time. And it's really interesting because they wouldn't understand, most people don't understand mechanical time. And that's what we have with the Nels Johnson clock. It's all the different components of how the uh, clock operates. Whereas, exactly. ex whereas somebody who has, a lot of people use their cell phones as a clock rather than yes. keeping even a watch. Right? That's right. The, our clock is uh, it's a double pendulum, triple hung uh, mechanical clock. Um, similar types of, and with temperature compensation, I might add, and it's tip, similar clocks would be something like the Ferry Building in San Francisco or Big Ben in London. However, those clocks have been electrified with motors to operate. Our clock, the San Jose Town Clock, is still hand wound twice a week. It's a mechanical clock. And most people nowadays, they think, oh, you mean like a clock on the kitchen wall? No, that's electrical. Like they don't friend, understand yeah. that. So there's a lot for young people to learn here, and it's, it's an exciting opportunity to get involved in science and technology via the art and science of time. So it's like a grandfather clock. Right? You're Very much like a grandfather clock. They're called, it's a tower clock. When it's, it's, it's the same principles. So for them to get involved with science and technology, you have the Tech Museum right down, right across the street from the right clock tower. The That'd be an <laughs> ideal place, in fact. The uh, previous director, uh, Peter Fries, uh, who was the director of the tech, oh, several years ago, when I brought this idea up to him, uh, he was uh, very enthused about the idea, in part because his background was horology, or the study of time and timekeeping. So it hit him just perfect. However, we weren't ready with the other components of trying to bring all this together. We'd like to get young people involved so that they can uh, have an active participation in seeing old clocks and how they work, whatnot. Uh, I want to remind that uh, many, many years ago there was a foreign country that so loved the United States that they sent a monument over to us. It landed in New York City, sat in the mud in the harbor for a long time in pieces, until finally school kids got together with their pennies and their nickels and they managed to buy enough money for a base to put this monument on, although the city leaders didn't want this thing in the city, so they decided to put it out on an island. And guess what that monument was? The Statue of the Liberty. Statue of Liberty. Yeah, and so part of the art and science of time is, is that we want young people to come in and get enthused about time and timekeeping, the different methodologies of doing so, uh, the architecture or art of building a place to keep or holding for time. And ideally, we'd like to ask each young person that comes in to bring in 10 pennies. When they do that, those 10 pennies will go toward building the new copper roof, which is what the original tower had, is a copper roof. So that years from now, these young people, as they're walking around town, they can point out to friends, oh, look, I helped build that. <laughs> That's so they, they take ownership then in the building. So that becomes, uh, it becomes theirs. They identify with it. And they're also learning something. And, and they're learning something. Now it's not just doing a little game thing or electronic thing or something like that on their handheld or something. They're actually getting in there and actually seeing. They're working gears and weights and measurements. They have to do the math. So hands-on. It, oh, it's, it's definitely hands-on. But that propels them. 
So we start them at the beginning of the 20th century and bring them into the 21st century via the arts and science of time. So going back, um, who winds the clock? You said oh, that's cool. interesting. He's a really nice fellow. Uh, he goes up there twice a week. His name is Ernie Renzel, and uh, he's the grandson of, uh, oh, excuse me, his name is John Renzel. He's the grandson of Ernie Renzel, who was a former mayor of San Jose back in the 1950s. So, and uh, he's sort of the custodian or keeper of the, of the clock, if you will. Wow, so he, he comes every week and winds it? Twice a week. He goes up the stairs. Uh, and very few people go up there. It's not open to the public, generally speaking, because they don't have the means to get people up there and it's access and these types of things. Uh, and it's unfortunate because, as I say, we have the oldest operating piece of high technology in San Jose, which bills itself as the capital mm -hmm. of Silicon Valley. And here's this uh, iconic piece of timepiece that uh, it's the public just doesn't get to see. And that's another reason we want to finish the clock tower and have it available to the public. Yeah, I tried to find out and do some research and found that the art, uh, San Jose Museum art is there and it's, it's kind of around the clock tower and, yes. and part of the um, other parts are the gift shop and the yes. cafe. Um, but yeah, you're right, the clock tower is not accessible. So why, what are obstacles that are um, preventing people from getting in seeing the clock tower or... Um... Well, right now there's just, there's no feasible access. You have to go through offices and stuff. And so it would take a great uh, capital project to uh, uh, bring about the restoration of the tower itself. Um, the museum's been there since, uh, for, for a number of years, probably going on f about 40 years now, longer. Uh, before that, it was a public library. And over the years, the interest of the museum about the clock tower has waxed and waned, I think, given in part due to the financial times and the economy and such. Um, like a lot of arts groups, uh, they're just struggling to keep, them, keep themselves going. And so, um, but it's a city-owned building, and so it's kind of something like the city really needs to take some lead on this to do this. Well, of course, the city uh, doesn't have the financial wherewithal to do it, so we're back kind of to square one. Um, but we think that there's ways to do this and getting everybody on board to work cooperatively. Uh, one of the things that the city wants to do is attract more people downtown. And they need to, they want to differentiate themselves, to set themselves apart from other urban areas, if you will. Um, so they have to have something that's unique that makes people want to come there and we think that the clock tower would be one of those things. It would be a there is a there there kind of a thing for them. A meeting location for yes, people. Yes, meet me yeah, under the clock exactly. or meet me at the clock tower. Yeah. And um, are there other um, cities that uh, have had restoration projects that were successful? And uh, Throughout the country, there have been a number of cities uh, that have uh, fixed up their town clocks. Um, uh, fortunately, though, there, the, nobody has a clock like we do. As far as we know, there's only one other Nels Johnson clock in existence. And as I said, the, uh, it, back in 1908, when the federal government shipped this clock out to the West Coast, San Jose probably needed a, a Chevy, and we got a Ferrari. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I'm not, I'm not spoiling any brands or anything for anybody, but. Uh, that's what we have, and we have this magnificent piece of technology. And it, you know, if it were to, it, I'm sure any city would love to have this. And if San Jose gets so broke that they need to, they could probably sell it, which would be no, no, that, no. that would be don't be like Detroit. Yeah, that would be, that would be <laughs> terrible. Uh, but it's it's a it's a it's a game winner. Uh, it's a it's a crowd pleaser. It's a public attraction, and uh, it's it's a public uh, asset. It belongs to the community. Yeah, definitely. It's it's part of a um, it's a timepiece for to uh, honor and uh, behold. That's well and, spoken. Uh, so definitely get out there and uh, help support the clock tower and you know everybody and do your part. And how can people uh, individuals yeah. you know is it word of mouth? Is it you know? Well, we on? have two places as I mentioned earlier. I'm on the board for. Preservation Action Council, that's just preservation.org. 
and we get involved in a lot of projects, uh, preservation of uh, historic places, uh, sites, buildings, and architecture. And we get in the news sometimes, and sometimes not favorably, because people are going, oh, they're stopping progress. But if you don't preserve some parts of your past, then you don't know what your past was, and you have no way to differentiate yourself. Um, the other way people can contact us is just go uh, uh, sjclocktower.org, and they can look us up on there. And we encourage people to do that, because we have so many people coming here from all over the world, and they get here and they know nothing about the landscape. Mm -hmm. They know nothing about what marks the land. And that's where landmarks is. The San Jose Clock Tower is a landmark. And by the new people coming here and people that have been here for a long time that don't even know we have a town clock can learn a little bit of history and become excited. And we'd like to encourage them to join. They want to contribute. They can do that at our preservation.org site. And um, we'd always, always encourage people to uh, participate and join. They're what They can do that as well on, on the websites. Yeah, you got to keep history and uh, keep the uh, very special landmarks, like you say. Because uh, I saw, um, like Venice, uh, you know, San Jose is a kind of younger, well, the United States is a young country, so right. they don't realize how important those sites are. And they just well, I think sometimes people don't fully rec or recognize or appreciate the importance of San Jose history. Uh, San Jose was the first city, was the first civil settlement. It was the first city of California before San Francisco, before Los Angeles. When this was a uh, Pueblo, we started as a Pueblo under the Spanish when uh, Governor Arriaga, whose uh, office was then in Monterey, uh, designated this place in Santa Clara Valley to be a civilian settlement. This had to do with the church and the government kind of getting us separated and having food supply for the soldiers and getting it away from the church. It's another story. But San Jose has a long and rich history and we need to appreciate it. Not just San Jose, but all the little communities that surround us, the different towns and cities around us, have rich, rich histories. You drive around and you see these names like Ringstorf. Where does that name come from? All, uh, Stelling, uh, Stevens yeah. Creek, where do these names come from? They're all landmarks. They all mark the land. And that's what preservation is all about. Okay. Um, as far as you were talking about how um, money and people are concerned about, you know, just the putting funds towards things. is Now, the restoration project, would it create jobs and would it um, have um, other learning? Uh, and uh... Sure, there would be jobs just in the construction of the actual tower itself. We'd be employing some skilled tradespeople to do stone masonry and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a registered landmark, so this is not going to be a high-tech clock tower, but all the activities, including the art and science of time STEM project, would certainly have a lot of ancillary benefits that spin off of this. Not to mention that when we get this program up and running, it's going to create a lot of interest in what's going on down there and draw people to it, which can only help the community as a whole. So what kind of obstacles also are, um, as far as helping the community, are they, what is uh, stopping? Is other than money? You know, well, is, uh, of course, money is the big, the big problem. And uh, I think it's getting a cohesiveness together. Uh, as I mentioned, people have been trying to do this probably going back to the 1930s. I met a fellow, he was a member of the local chapter of the Association, National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. And he'd been advocating since probably the 1950s to fix the clock. I volunteered to fix it for free and the city wouldn't even let him in the building. They just didn't want to bother with it. And uh, I managed to get him up there on a tour some years back. It's been the first time in probably 30 years that he'd seen the Nels Johnson clock. He was almost crying when we left the building. He was just so happy to see that clock. But there are, um, so just getting people involved on different levels it'd be, would be a, a really good thing to do. Um, it, just generates interest, not just in the clock tower, but it 
preservation in general, and that's one of the aspects or one of the ideas behind restoring the clock tower, is all of a sudden it gives people something to look at and go, oh my gosh, what other gems do we have in our midst here that we don't even know about? There could be an old farmhouse over here in Sunnyvale. Could be, uh, who knows what, some old buildings in Cupertino. Uh, the people would say, Michael, well, let's look into the history of this and find out about this. Now the place that you live in is so much richer for it. It makes you so much more appreciative of what you have around you. And then you get a little look at, uh, say, an old photo of some place that you've, a place that you're familiar with. And you go, oh, my gosh, this is what it looked like 100 years ago. It really brings things home to you and gives you a sense of place. And that's what, that's what landmarks do, is give you a sense of place. Yeah, there's definitely a, over a hyper-development of uh, all kinds of new buildings and residential areas and places growing and growing and uh, we're losing. And so losing certain um, important sites. So it's that's definite, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of the, the things that preservation uh, is all about. And if people go to preservation.org, they can, they can read about us, they can join in, and they can, we have people to come to us and bring, bring things to our attention. It was just a, a year, a couple years ago, somebody came to us and said, you know, there's an old railroad trestle in Willow Glen that's going to get torn down, and it's got so, a lot of historic significance. The last cannery in the valley, which used to be known as the Valley of the Heart's Delight, shipped rail cars full of uh, canned uh, peaches, tomatoes, what a, across this very wooden trestle, and uh, it's being threatened now. And that's, so somebody came forward and said, hey, preservation people, and now we got them involved in other things. People getting together and working together and that's right. getting involved, that's important. That's definitely um, the message for tonight is get involved. That's, that's right. Save uh, your, save your uh, historic uh, landmarks. Uh, try and preserve something that you have in your community that's, that's significant, that uh, you think would be meaningful to somebody. Go out and discover something in your neighborhood or your community that's historically significant. And you'd be surprised. I was just a few weeks ago over to a friend's house not too far away, and he lived in an older neighborhood, but his neighbor had behind his house what they call the settler's shack, and it was an old house that was built in the 1860s or something that time forgot. Okay, um, thank you so much right. for uh, all uh, sharing about the clock tower. Thank and you. What, what's the final um, message you want to give before? Uh, oh, I would just encourage people to get involved in uh, preservation. Again, you can go to preservation.org. And if they have interest in the clock tower, they can go to sjclocktower.org. We're on Facebook. We have a lot of people that go on Facebook. They'll post things, comments, and such. Just get involved in preservation. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. This Thank you. Has, uh, been in our community. Um, I'm your host, Brian Cracker, and everyone have a good night. Thank you. And thank you to our crew and uh, um, everyone who is, uh, we're all volunteers here, so. Thank you. And good volunteers, mm -hmm. if I had, yes.